Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. I am pleased to be back with you for this episode. Honored to have my guest, Robert LeBlanc he of the Catholic Moment. He's a Catholic husband, father, educator. Robert has been proclaiming the truth of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ for over 20 years in Catholic school classrooms and as a parish lay catechist. At the heart of Robert's ministry is the notion that our Catholic faith not only forms us, but transforms us into the saints that God calls us to be. The journey may be long and arduous, but heaven is worth it. And he's also the co-host of a great podcast you should check out, Pints and Pews. Uh, Robert, how are you doing today? Very blessed, William. Very blessed. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. And um, it's, I, I love having new guests on. And I've been we've been Facebook friends for quite a while. And I've been meaning to ask you for quite a while. And I finally got around to doing it. So my apologies to you for not asking you sooner. <laughs> no, like I said, I'm, I'm flattered and honored. And when I look at the, the guest role that you have, uh, I just hope I can meet up to the same standard that uh, you, you have, William. So, but again, thank you very much for, for inviting me to be here. Well, again, my pleasure. Before we get into the, I want I invited you on to talk about the sacramental life. I guess before we get into that, let's talk about, um, I want to talk about your podcast for a moment and all the stuff that you've been doing. Uh, your, you and your co-host, Dennis, of the uh, Pints and Pews podcast. How's that been going? Very well. I, we're, we're very excited. We are just published yesterday, episode 13. So it's still quite new for us. It's new, new for there. We started this past Lent. Uh, Dennis and I actually, we work together. So we're having these kind of conversations all the time where we're constantly, you know, at each other's classroom door and, and talking things of the faith or we're over lunch, you know, talking about different aspects of living our, our Catholic lives. And we finally just decided, you know, why don't we just hit record on these every so often and put it out there and, and see what happens. Uh, a lot of the genesis comes from too in the fact that uh, we would try once every couple of weeks when things were a little bit more open to get together with other like-minded gentlemen uh, over a pint to talk about the faith and have that, that fraternity and it comes from uh, G.K. Chesterton's quote, you know, in Catholicism, the pint, the pipe, and the cross can all fit together. And so that notion of fraternal community over a pint brings us to the spiritual communion of the mystical body of Christ. Great. And, and, and we've started too, and it was, uh, you know, very nervous. You're, you're used to having guests on your show. Uh, when we started opening up to having guests, it's like, okay, how are we going to do this? But we're, we're very pleased. And again, we're just very blessed that we're able to, to put that out there. Great. Any feedback that you received from the podcast so far? Uh, everything's been positive. Uh, Good. You know, and, and that's not just from family and friends as well. Like we've had people on the Facebook page uh, that have gone on and said that they really enjoy what we're doing. They, they like what we've been putting together. They really like the premise of, you know, just, getting together, having a, a pint or two and, and talking the faith. And, and one of our taglines is, you know, we take the faith seriously, but not necessarily ourselves. Uh, and just that notion of, of fraternal banter. Uh, and it's okay to have a, a chuckle or two while we're talking about the faith. Sure, uh, sure. But as long as we realize that our Catholic faith is guiding us to heaven and the, the circumstances or the, the consequences of how we live our faith or what it's all about right so everyone check out the podcast pints and pews uh, wherever wherever you listen to your favorite podcast so go ahead and check it out i listen on the podbean app where my pod where this podcast is hosted as well but i know it's available elsewhere so uh robert the sacramental life i mean maybe for those who have heard the term but don't know what it is what exactly are we talking about there we're talking about living our life through the sacraments and, and having the sacraments form our lives. Uh, one thing I always like to say is that uh, Catholicism isn't just an hour on Sunday. Our Catholicism, our Catholic faith is there to form and guide us and really needs to make up who we are as human individuals. And so when we look at living the sacramental life, we need to look at you know, living through these conduits of God's grace, these uh, visible and physical signs that our Lord Jesus Christ has given us, 
uh, of his invisible and spiritual blessing or his, visible, his invisible and spiritual love for us. Uh, and one of the mistakes I find when we talk about living the sacramental life is we tend to focus on only two of the second, seven sacraments. Mm-hmm. We tend to focus mostly on the Eucharist first and then confession. But we need to realize to live a life that is sacramental, we need to live all of the seven sacraments. All of the seven sacraments need to go into forming how we present ourselves as members of the mystical body of Christ out to the world. Okay. Yeah, very important. Very important. I, I totally agree with you. Like you said, we normally focus on confession and Eucharist, and don't get me wrong, they're super important. Vitally we, important. And we need to do those as often as possible, <laughs> for mm-hmm. sure. But how, how can we live out those other sacraments? Well, let's start at the beginning. Let's start okay. with baptism. Right? Our, in living out our baptismal promises. Right? And for most of us, especially those of us that are cradle Catholics, like myself, it was our parents and our godparents who made those baptismal promises for us. And so we really aren't always 100% sure what are our baptismal promises? How can I live out my baptism in my day-to-day life? And even myself, I had to go back from time to time. What are our baptismal promises? I need to, to look these up, right? Because we just have a tendency to live in the world and let our faith slide. Uh, so those baptismal promises that were made on our behalf by our parents and our godparents way back when, uh, we renew those promises every Easter. And in many ways, we renew those promises, our baptismal promises, each and every time we enter the church and we dip our hand in the holy water fount and we make the sign of the cross with the holy water because it is uh, a recollection of our baptism and, and those baptismal promises. And so to live those baptismal promises, let's t- you know, take a quick look at them. You know, the, the first one, when we're asked at Easter by the priest, instead of saying the creed, and again, a lot of these we say every Sunday when we, when we announce the creed, when we pronounce the, the creed, but no, do you reject Satan, all his works and all his promises? Uh, to which the faithful always reply, I do. Growing up, we had a pastor who had a bit of a sense of humor. And, you know, when he would ask that question, you know, do you renounce Satan? And people say, I do. He'd be like, I can't hear you. You know, asking people to, <laughs> to say that yell it out. louder, right? Uh, and we should yell it out. And we should say that from the top of our voices. Yes, I reject Satan. Uh, and then he would always, after everyone shouts at he says, well, of course you do. But do we? Hmm. Do we reject Satan? his works and his promises do we live in the world with a sense of detachment Uh, my favorite daily devotional after doing the the lexio so after reading the the readings of the day is i also read chapter by chapter each day from the imitation of christ by thomas wow powerful and exactly and continually talking about detachment from worldly goods do we live a life of detachment from what the world has to offer. Uh, One look at myself in a bathing suit, you would know that I am not all that detached from food. Gluttony is one of those sins that I have difficulty with. Uh, I always say I'm tapered, but just in the opposite direction than, than the dress shirts. But do we reject Satan? And I think back, every time I think of that baptismal promise, do we reject Satan? I think of C.S. Lewis screw tape letters and where the, the senior demon is talking to the junior demon. He says, one of the best things you can do is have your human believe that you do not exist. Mm, and I think yeah. that's been one of Satan's greatest accomplishments in our time, yes. that we no longer believe that he or hell exists. Right, uh, and, and thinking of that, the reading that we're that was for today when we're recording this, uh, our Lord talks about when He was uh, explaining the parable of the wheat and the weeds that grow together, and He says, "At the end of the age, the angels will take the weeds that Satan has sown in the kingdom of God, 
and throw them into the fiery furnace where they'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Right? And we tend to forget that. Yeah. So from that's the first thing to, to live out our baptismal promise is looking at, do you reject Satan and his works? Is, do you have a detachment from the things of this world? God's created world is good. What we do with it sometimes is not exactly as he intended. So when you talk about detachment, you're talking about like not having, I guess not let, letting our passions overtake our reason and like forming addictions, like you said, gluttony, for example, or I don't know, let's just say sexual pleasure, maybe whatever the case is, is that kind of what you're about? Exactly. So okay. that, that detachment from the, like I said, God's creation is good. And when we read the creation story at the end of each day, God looked at his creation and saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. And then when he looked upon humanity made in his image, he saw that it was very good. Uh, and I've heard people say, you know, God doesn't make junk. I know God doesn't make junk, but what we use or how we use what God creates can create pollution in our souls. And so having that detachment, I mean, we need food. And when I talk about you know, this detachment, say, from, from gluttony, we need food to survive. But we don't need to go to the buffet restaurant and go up to the table 12, 13, 14 times. Right. Right. And, and that's having that detachment. Uh, we try to eat healthily here in our home uh, and even produce from our, from our own garden. But one serving should suffice. I shouldn't be getting up and refilling my plate two or three times. It's very tasty and I enjoy it. But then I get to the point where it's like, I don't feel well anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that sense of detachment. You know, you're talking about our, our sexuality as well. Uh, sexuality is good. God created our, our sexuality for a reason. Right. It's when we start seeing the pleasure of the sexuality as the end game as opposed to the uniting and creative aspect of it that we start to get ourselves into trouble right and so that continues into to living our baptismal promises you know do you believe in god the father the creator of heaven and earth like, yeah, of course i do but how many people out there including practicing catholics look at you know that creation came out of a vacuum came out of a void it just happened to occur do you believe in jesus christ that he was born of a virgin he suffered his death rose again uh, ascended into heaven and he sits there in judgment i've had people come up and say and, and these are, are practicing catholics jesus won't judge us oh yeah you will <laughs> yeah, well, look, you go to mass on sunday yeah well let's just recite the creed together you know and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. You, you might want to rethink that. Right? And again, that comes back to the, the scripture reading from this morning. Yeah. Right? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting? Um, yes, I do. But when you say yes, I do to that, you're saying yes to everything that's in there. Right? And not, as we say, the, the cafeteria Catholics. Right. Living a sacramental life begins with living our baptismal promises. And maybe we should be reminded of those more than just once a year at Easter. Yeah. So, I mean, think of the theological implications in living out those, living out those promises, you know, uh, the divinity of Christ, virgin birth, the resurrection, the uh, second coming, um, the reality of the evil one who's trying to drag us down with them to hell. I mean, there's a lot there to go through and i think if, like you said if we just if we realize that and re-examine those promises do we really believe this as we should it's gonna it's gonna have an impact on our lives yeah but that takes a lot of work absolutely it's not, it's not yeah. easy and, and again i think just in our times in our society we're always looking for the easy route the the, the path of least resistance uh, Matthew Kelly talks about our society being individualist, uh, hedonist, and minimalist. It's all about me. It's all about my pleasure. And what's the least amount I have to do to get it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we approach our faith life like that. 
sometimes as well, the, the, the sin of uh, presupposition then. We're all going to heaven. Uh, we need to dig a little, a little bit deeper. And I, I like you talk about having that, that notion of examining our lives because that brings us into the, the sacrament of, I always call it the sacrament of reconciliation, but confession, reconciliation, and penance. Right? All three of those elements that, that go into that because we have forgotten our, our notion of sinfulness mm -hmm. in this world. Right? We've made gods of, our, of ourselves. And one of the things we can do to re-recognize our sinfulness, re-recognize that God is God and I am not, is to do a daily examination of conscience. As we're lying in bed at night, uh, unfortunately, I have the, the problem, my head hits the pillow and it's lights out. But as we're ending our day, just to go back through our day and look at, yes, what we've done well, but also where have we fallen short? And that re-examining of, of making ourselves right with God on a daily basis. Uh, when we look at it, and I was surprised to learn this myself, but when we look at the sacrament of confession, we're only obliged to go once a year. Yeah. I'm looking at that going, that is very minimalist. Uh, and when people ask me about the sacrament of confession, I'll, I'll ask them, you know, you're made as a human, you're made body and soul. And our physical body, uh, as Scott Hahn tells us, you know, there's 100% mortality rate. That yeah. physical body is going to eventually come to an end. But the good news is, is there's a 100% immortality rate. Right? So we just need to choose our destination wisely with, with that. And so when I talk to people, I say, okay, you've got your body and you've got your soul. Your body is going to come to an end, but your soul is going to live on for eternity. Well, how often do you bathe? How often do you take a shower or take a bath? You know, how well do you look after your physical body? Uh, for some people, not myself, but for some people that's going to the gym, exercise. Uh, but again, I, I always like to say it's, it's that shower that you take. Well, confession is like a shower for your soul. So if you're bathing on a daily basis for your physical body, that's going to come to an end, but you're only bathing or you're only showering your soul once a year, it's going to start to stink. Right. A lot of dirt builds up. <laughs> yeah. Right, the same. You don't take a shower for, for a couple of days. You're going to have lots of room at, at the supermarket because people are going to be avoiding because you, you have that physical odor. Well, your soul will, will start to stink as well. So we really need to live that sacramental life, you know, examine our soul daily, and then give it that life-giving shower of the sacrament of, of confession on a more regular basis. How often do you think someone should go? I think those of us that are trying to live in a state of grace monthly, okay. monthly, that, that would be my suggestion. Uh, we were talking before our good friend, David Scubin of the Catholic Canuck podcast. He says, you know, get to confession at least three times a year, Advent, Lent, and anytime you're in a state of mortal sin. Uh, but again, are you only going to shower three times a year? So, Monthly for most of us, because again, the, the confitior and the sacrament of the Eucharist on a weekly basis does help us with those venial sins. Right. Uh, but if there's something that's laying heavy on your heart, uh, and I've had for myself sins that I know I committed way back when as a teenager and wasn't comfortable confessing them, and they just weighed on my soul and weighed on my soul. And when I finally did take those to confession that feeling of elation and cleanliness and since then they don't niggle at the back of my mind anymore they're not niggling at my conscience anymore yeah. and i know some people say well i have problems with confessing my, my sins to another person so well no you're confessing them to christ right uh, but there's that sitting across the room from someone and doing that that's difficult and for the longest time as well because it was good friends with our pastor was going to the neighboring parish for confession just because as much as I know I'm confessing to Christ, the person who's sitting there in, in persona Christi is also a good friend. And it's just 
awkward. And the other thing I suggest for those people who are coming back to the sacrament of reconciliation, you know, as daunting as the traditional confessional and the dark little room with the screen is, uh, it's also, I find it opens up a little bit more because you're not looking father in the eye, right? As you're recounting your, your sins, you're there by yourself whispering them through the screen. Right. Yeah, definitely. And de- we definitely need to go. I think we all can go to confession a little bit more than what we currently do. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, frankly, as humans, we need to almost spend our life in there because you can be in the confessional and you come out, and you go, oh, you know, all of my sins are forgiven. All of a sudden now you've fallen into the sin of pride and you got to make a U-turn and head right back. You know? I know when I tell my students, I teach um, elementary religious education at my parish. And whenever we talk about the sacrament, like who's messed up? Who's like, who's lied to their mom and dad? Who's stolen something, whatever? Who messed up this morning? And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I did. I, yeah. I messed up this morning. <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, because we all, we all mess up. We're all in need of God's grace. And that's one of the things I do with my students uh, teaching religion classes when the priests come in in Advent and Lent to offer the sacrament of confession to the students. I make sure I'm first in line so that they see that and to, to lead by example. Great. Great. So how about another sacrament? Yeah, the Eucharist, the, the, the source and summit Amen. of our faith. Right? Uh, And it saddens me to say, and I know your listeners have probably heard this ad nauseum, not because uh, of your podcast per se, but just because it's been out there for a number of years, the the Pew study that spoke about how 70% of church going Catholics no longer believe in the real presence. Horrible. And how did we get there? How did that happen? And for myself, when I take a step back and, and look and I meditate on this question, I think a lot of it has to do with a lost sense of the sacredness that we have at at mass. Um, And that's a whole other question and a whole other, our podcast, especially right now with um, the, the motu proprio that came out, the, the, the scaling back of the traditional Latin mass, but you know, we can look at how can we restore this sense of sacredness? How can we restore this, the sense of, knowing and understanding the real presence in the Eucharist. And the first thing I would say to that is we need to get to adoration. We need to spend time in front of the blessed sacrament outside of mass, get to know Christ in the blessed sacrament. And I would say, I'm so very blessed to teach in a Catholic high school uh, and we have a chapel and the blessed sacrament is there. And that's how I start each and every day. I arrive at school. I don't even go to my classroom, leave my, my coat and my briefcase at the back of the chapel. And I go and spend five, 10, 15 minutes kneeling before the blessed sacrament. That just allows me to center my day. It allows me to lay all of my worries at the feet of God. And it helps me to connect with others in the mystical body of Christ. The odd time when maybe someone else is there in the chapel and then touching base with them. But having that centeredness and having started my day in adoration, when other things come up through the day, it can bring Christ into the conversation. Uh, and I can't tell you the number of students who have tripped over me as I walk in front of the chapel uh, with the, the big plate glass doors. Uh, so you can see the tabernacle there. And I'll stop and genuflect. And I always kind of have to look in the rear view mirror, make sure there's not someone who's going to take a tumble when, <laughs> when I stop to do that, right? So spending time in adoration is like the first step that anyone can do to reinvigorate that sense of the real presence and listening to our Lord. Uh, I always say when I'm spending time in adoration, the first five minutes is spent getting the hamster wheel to stop turning in my brain. Oh, yeah. Right, just so that I can put myself silently in our Lord's presence. And from that, we can then start looking at the mass with a deeper sense of sacredness. And again, like I said, we could get into a a whole other discussion on on that right now. But if the the Novus Ordo Mass 
is done properly, if it's done right, it is beautiful. Yeah. And it, and it is sacred. Um, and I say there, there's two ads that need to go into the Novus Ordo Mass. We need to add Latin back in. And when you look at the doc, when you look at Sancro Sanctum Concilium, when you look at the documents of Vatican II, it actually calls for the major parts of the Mass, the Gloria, the Sanctus, and the Agnus Dei, to be prayed in Latin. Right. And it even says it's the pastor's responsibility to ensure that the faithful have some rudimentary knowledge of Latin. But we need to add that Latin. And again, it's not because it's some magical language. It's not so that you know, it can be secretive and, and shut the uninitiated out. It's to restore that sense of adoration for God. This is something special. This is something that's above and beyond our created world. And the other is ad orientum. In the Novus Ordo Mass, the priests can and should be praying ad orientum. And again, when you look at the general instruction of the Roman Missal, uh, it's alluded to there, uh, Benedict XVI's spirit of the liturgy. And he talks about this as well. And it's not the priest turning his back on the people. It's the priest turning and facing Christ in the tabernacle and leading his people as a pastor, as a shepherd towards God. And I think if we restore that sense of sacredness to the liturgy, the full and active participation, the prayerful participation of the faithful in the Eucharist will increase. And I look at you know, praying the offertory. It's not just a moment to you know, panic and reach into your wallet to throw a fiver into the, the basket as it goes by. Uh, it's a moment to close your eyes and pray and, and imagine offering your own heart on the altar with the bread and the wine. And that's how I, I connect myself to the, the body of Christ. And I, I envision my heart there on the paten beside the, the host. Uh, often it's, it's darkened by sin. And we think of those adver the anti-smoking advertisements where they would show the, the lungs all. Right, the black lungs. Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes that, that's my heart on the altar because it's, it's a blackened heart from my sinfulness. Uh, it's a pierced heart from my sorrows. And as Father prays the consecration and imagining myself in the upper room, I can see my heart transform and return to its, its redness and its life and the la cicatrice. I'm sorry, like I said before that you know, kind of bouncing between two languages with French and English. Uh, the pierced, he, uh, you know, healing itself. And so we can become one and and seeing ourselves joined to Christ in the sacrifice and in the Eucharist, and then the prayers that we make before. And after the Eucharist, hmm. uh, from uh, Saint Louis de Montfort's um, devotion to to Our Lady, I can sort the the name of the book is is escaping me right now. Uh, True devotion and making the consecration to Our Lady and saying a prayer before going to receive the Eucharist. You know, Lord God and Father, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that's visible and visible, uh, it's through your creation that I have life, and that's a life I don't deserve but you give it to me out of your love. Mm -hmm. It's through your creation that my life is sustained and it's a sustenance that I don't deserve, but God, you give me that sustenance out of your love for me. And it's through your great creation that you come to me now in the Eucharist and a gift of the Eucharist that I do not deserve, but you give to me out of your great love for me. And God, the son, our Lord Jesus Christ, it's through your sacrifice that I will have access to eternal life. And it's a sacrifice that I don't deserve, but a sacrifice that you made out of your love for me. And God, the Holy Spirit, who inspires us and sends forth an inspiration and guiding me towards God, the Father and the Son, it's an inspiration that I don't deserve, but you give out of your great love for me. And it's approaching our Lord then in the Eucharist that way, that there's just a deeper understanding and appreciation for his real presence. Amen. Definitely something we need to cultivate more. I mean, absolutely. 
taking that time to stand in that awe-inspiring moment after receiving the Eucharist, sitting down in the pew, praying, thanking God for this great gift. I try to impress that on my kids. Like, it's time to pray. It's not a time to talk. <laughs> like, pray, relax. Yeah. And then the other thing, after having received the Eucharist, uh, and I know there's some people say, well, you should just let the Eucharist dissolve in your, in your mouth. You should not chew down on, on our Lord. Um, but I've heard in the Eucharistic discourse, the verb that our Lord used when he says, you need to eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, the verb he used was more along the lines of to gnaw on. Yeah, flesh. struggle. Yeah, gnaw, crunch. Gnaw, crunch, devour. Uh, kind of the same way a dog does with a bone. And so when I'm receiving the Eucharist, and I, I, I will chew down, gnaw on, devour the Eucharist because it is giving me that life-giving sustenance. Right? Amen. Without it, we will eternal death. Right. Okay. Uh, from that, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what we call sometimes Catholic graduation. Right? Oh, yeah. Confirmation. All right. <laughs> it's Catholic graduation. Uh, because you hardly see the kids until they come for confirmation class. And I was confirmation catechist for a number of years in, in our parish. And then once they're confirmed, gonzo, it's almost like, yeah, you can go out into the world. And, we, and it is a call to go out into the world, but also to come back. And right. the confirmation, it's a confirming of our faith. It's, you know, be sealed with the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That strengthening of our faith so that we can go out and you link that to Pentecost each and every time, the, the descent of the Holy Spirit, and then being able to go forth and make disciples of all nations. Right? Uh, and so, again, that notion of living our confirmation sacramentally is to go out and not necessarily like you or I with podcasts or YouTube channels, but just by the way we live our lives. Right. And being that witness for Christ through our lives so that we can bring others closer to him, right? Because people are watching. Absolutely. We know that we are Catholics, are, are watching, and more often they're watching for us to trip up, right? Because they have no problem to, to point out all the shortcomings of, of the Catholic Church. But if we're living a sacramental life, if we're living our life as we're called, as laity, they're going to see something magnetic in that. They're going to see something attractive in that. And it's not in the way we live during the good times. It's the way we live our faith during the difficulties, during the trials and tribulations. And I think that's the key right there. They, they see how, how is he going to, how, how is he going to react to this situation now that this bad thing's happened? Is this faith really going to sustain him through? Like I said, people are watching all the time. And definitely something we need to keep in mind. And to live our life joyfully. No one likes a sour saint. Sure. To, live, to live our life joyfully in those difficult times, people say, oh, they must have something there. They, there must be something that they have that's supporting them through all of that. Right. So, I don't, I don't know. How much time do we have? Oh, you're fine. You're fine. So the confirmation, it, it, even though we joke around and we call it Catholic graduation, and sometimes the same could be said about RCIA classes. Okay. Well, because confirmation it happens there too, of course. But that's, it's the commissioning. We go out, we live the gospel with our lives. Maybe if we're, if we're called to defend the faith, whatever the case is. But now um, they said marriage and holy orders, go for it. So marriage, uh, I was meditating on marriage uh, in three weeks, four weeks. On August 17th, my wife and I will be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and when I look back to 25 years ago, you know, and I think everyone in their mid-20s goes through a year or two where you go to like a dozen weddings, if not more, over the course of a summer. Right? Like everyone's getting married because you just had that, that stage of life. But when I look back to 25 years ago and the dozen or so weddings that we went to that particular year, uh, we are one of maybe four couples that are still together. Wow. Right? Wow. Which breaks my heart. 
breaks my heart. And, and some of them stood up as witness at these weddings. Right? You kind of go, so what makes our marriage so different? What makes our, our, our marriage so different that it's been able to make these 25 years? And like Fulton Sheen says, there were three of us that got married that day. Amen. My wife, myself, but most importantly, the Lord. And so when I look at, back at how has the Catholic faith strengthened our marriage, and if people want a little bit more detail on that, there is an article on the catholicmoment.ca website in the blog there, you know, how the Catholic faith has strengthened our marriage. Uh, you'll get now the kind of the 30-second rundown uh, of that. Uh, but first and foremost, trust. The two made one flesh. We are one and the same person. And I, and I firmly believe that God intended for my wife and I to get married since our conception. Even before we conceived, that was part of God's plan that we would be married. And I think back to our wedding day, standing at the altar when the doors at the back of the church open and my wife, or soon-to-be wife, stepped through the, the doors a sense of calm came over me and just a sense that this is right. This is what God wants. And so we become the, the two made one. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, do I trust myself? Well, then I'm, if I trust myself, then I'm trusting my wife just as much, if not more. Right? So the, there's that sense of, of trust. And from that trust, that trust is built up through forgiveness in our marriage. Uh, that forgiving of the other. And I always say when I talk about forgiveness, you know, usually I'm speaking to a room full of gentlemen. I say, gentlemen, you know, think of that one thing that your wife does that drives you bananas, right? drives you absolutely insane. So what, if you think of that one thing that your wife does that drives you insane, you're doing a million other things that drive her even more crazy. And she right. says absolutely nothing. So you need to be forgiving because forgiving goes both ways. And in that notion of forgiveness, you need to be able to ask, ask for forgiveness, ask pardon, step back. We said that daily examination of conscience, step back and look at, yeah, I messed up. I know I hurt you and I don't want to hurt you. What can we do together? as a couple to move forward to make this better and, and learning from that. Right. And that takes humility. And that's kind of the, the, the next point of, uh, and how the Catholic faith strengthens our marriage is having that sense of humility to ask for forgiveness, to ask for pardon. That notion of God is God and I am not. And if I'm not God, I'm definitely not superior within this marriage. And whenever I teach about marriage, I say, you know, why did God use Adam's rib to make Eve, well, not from the foot, she's not inferior, and it's not from the skull, she's not superior, but because you're to be side by side, equals, partners. Great. And from that, there's service. And from that, I just think of Ephesians 5.25. You know, Men, be like Christ to your wives. And what did Christ do for us? Died for he, us. he sacrificed himself on the cross for us, so we need to be sacrificial for our wives, for our families, for our children. Thanksgiving. Uh, went a few times to, to weddings for my wife's cousins at my mother-in-law's parish. And the priest always in his homily at the weddings would say, more so to the groom, but he would say, at the end of each day, get down on your knees and thank God for your spouse. Thank God that he had this person set out for you since your conception. And if my mom were to say anything, she would say that, you know, I need to be thankful for my wife because no one else would have me. Right. And from all of this, it's held together with the glue of prayer. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the prayerful life within the family. Uh, and I, I'll, how many times through the course of the day, my wife and I will stop and pray together. Yes, at mealtime, but at other times too. I have an alarm set on my phone for the Angelus at noon. And so we'll go out to the garden and pray before a statue of Our Lady. 
as a married couple. Right? Mm. Uh, inviting our, our son is a teenager now, so we don't see him as often as we, we used to, but when he's around prayer life, when we go out to work in the mornings, doing a family benediction you know, with, with holy water and blessing each other and praying for each other before we go out into the Great. wide world for that day. Great. Powerful stuff there. Um, I think a lot of things that are often overlooked for, for marriage, you, you talked about the term sacrifice, like our Lord did for us. And I think in our culture today, we have this tendency, you know, me, 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 me. And that's not how marriage works. It's all about the other person. Marriage is not for the selfish. <laughs> exactly. And I, I think, I think, um, I think in today's day and age, we've forgotten that a little bit, it's even in the church. And sorry for my dog going off right now. <laughs> to join in. Oh, yeah. All right. So, um, and the holy orders, the, the, the priesthood, uh, respecting the office, even if for whatever reason you can't respect the person. Uh, I don't know how many times I, I've heard people say, I will mention it again, and we spoke about uh, confession. Why should I confess my sins to another guy? Well, no, right. you're not confessing them to another guy. You're confessing them to Christ. It happens to be through that other guy. And those signs of, of respect for the office. Uh, I read a story yesterday or the day before uh, where a gentleman, he was doing a, an article like a, investigative reporter and he was putting on different uniforms to see how people react to the different uniforms and you know as a police officer as as a doctor and one of the things he did is he walked around downtown chicago in a cassock for a day mm. and he said that was the most tiring and draining experience he had ever had because people don't necessarily they see the cassock but they don't see the man in the cassock they see christ and so they're reaching out for those blessings, that, those sacramental blessings or the, the, the blessings. They're looking for that guidance. They're looking for that spiritual help from the, the cassock. And he said he found, too, that people were always wanting to, to touch him and you know, just kind of reach out and touch him on the, on the arm. The same way when you think about in the Gospels where um, the lady just you know, reach out and touch the tassel right well, and there's such a that certain sense of respect and i think that respect for the office of christ in the ordained ministers is the reason why when they do not live out their ministry as they should it hurts it hurts and the, the fall is that much greater yeah so again being respect most of us are, are called to the married life or to the single life Many of us are not called to the ordained life, but we need to have a, a deeper respect for those men that has been called to that life, deeper respect for the sacrifice that they're making, because like John the Baptist, they're saying, you know, he must increase, I must decrease. Um, and being respectful of them, and this can be done in just little ways. Right. Calling them by their, their last name. You know, father plus the last name. And if it's a good friend, father and first name. Uh, and I find that across society as a teacher, uh, I find um, you know, the respect is you know, you know, the students will leave the Mr. off the first name. Uh, in English, it's not as easy to, to see, but uh, in, in French or German or Portuguese and, and a lot of the Latin languages, there is a a politesse, a polite way of speaking to people you don't know very well or people who hold a particular office. The, the these and the thous don't exist in, in English right. anymore. One is just you. But we need to be treating our priests with the these and the thous and that respect for their, their holy office. Uh, and one of the things that happens in our parish for that is after the introductory rites of the Mass and it's time for the readings, Everybody remains standing until Father himself sits. Mm, okay. Just a small sign of respect, not for him, the man, but for his ministry, for, for Christ in him. Okay. 
Never thought about that one. That's that's good. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the other one too, I had just heard, I'd never heard of this before. I just heard it in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and it's more in the first year of their ordained priesthood is kissing the inside of the palms, kissing the inside of the hands of the newly ordained priests after receiving a blessing because it's uh, that's where they've been anointed during their ordination. And as well, it's representative of the, the wounds of Christ, the, the invisible stigmata if you will okay. wow yeah i haven't heard that one either great okay even though we're not called to live that particular sacrament we are called to respect it and right especially good. because because the sacrifices they're making for us as well because it's not an easy not an easy life at all <laughs> no. no and especially in the last year and a half i think it's been made even more difficult absolutely so Robert, what's been? Thank you for going over the sacramental life with us through the seven sacraments. What's going on with the with the uh, Catholic moment? Catholic moment, I need a little push. So if you don't mind giving, me okay, it, it's a lot of it's been a question of time. Uh, I have a couple of different ideas set up for videos, um, but it's having the time to set up the home studio, get it together, record it, and then do the do the editing. But I, I hope to get a couple of videos out through this summer. Uh, I have been offering online uh, retreats, especially when everything's been, been shut down and we can't get together in our parishes for, for sure. retreat. Uh, so I did a Lenten mission where we meditated on the, the wounds of Christ and how we can live sacramentally, reflecting on our own woundedness in the wounds of Christ. Uh, in the month of May, I also did one on what Mary says to us through the gospel so meditating on the the words that, that mary has uh hopefully in the fall i'm looking forward to we're now where we are in the toronto area uh, able to have in-person sessions in-person retreats so i'm looking forward to being back in front of people because you know when it's on screen through the zoom it's just not the same right i, I totally agree <laughs> but i'm looking to continuing with with, with that uh, really excited uh, well, this fall having a, a new book come out as well. Oh, great. Uh, Justin Press, which is a small Catholic press up here in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, it's five smooth stones taking on the, the Goliaths of our lives, the fear, the, the Goliaths of our fears. Great. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. So when we look at the story of David and Goliath and, and David reaches down, he puts five smooth stones to take on, on Goliath. So what are those, those five stones? And so that's, and I'll just leave it at that. You'll have to, to look at the book. Get the book. What the five smooth stones are. <laughs> Great. So what's your website so people can check it out? Check out what you're doing. Catholicmoment.ca. Okay. So the .ca for fiercely Canadian. Fiercely. All right. It's not to say that there's anything wrong with south of the border. Uh, but no, just very proud to be to be a Canadian. So catholicmoment.ca. Uh, on there, I have some written work or the blog, the videos you can find there, which are also available on YouTube. Uh, and as well, there's a link to the podcast, the Pints Infused podcast. So uh, yeah, it's busy times, but it's all for the greater good. It's all, all for the kingdom of God. Great. And we thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you for coming on and um, leading us through the sacraments on how to lead a better sacramental life. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Oh, thank you very much for having me. God bless. Yeah.